Hi everyone, I'm Ed from Falmouth University. Um, the next two talks this morning are going to be from the Metamakers Institute, which is the research group that Simon Colton leads. And we're both going to be talking about the app that we're making to try and democratize game design and uh, do all kinds of cool things like that. Um, so my talk is going to be about um, some work that we've done on automatically tweaking game levels um, for this idea of creating uh, games entirely on your mobile device. Um, so I'm going to introduce the app that we're working on, um, which this week is called Gamica, although it has been through several name changes. Um, and as a case study, I'm going to look at a game called Let It Snow, um, which is a game that Simon designed um, within the app and some of the tools that we've added to the app to try and facilitate that design. Um, in particular, automated playtesting of levels for, for this game and automated tweaking of the parameters for those levels. Um, so um, we're looking at the idea of game creation on the mobile device. Um, so what exists out there currently? Um, so these are the criteria that I'm interested in, um, which I'll talk about a bit as I go along. Um, so traditionally, when people want to make games for mobile devices, when the professionals do it, they use something like Unity or Game Maker or Unreal, or they code up their own game engine in C++ or something like that. Um, obviously, you can't do that on the mobile device itself. You need a, a PC or a laptop um, to do that. And you need to know how to program. Um, so you need to do like a, a three-year undergraduate degree course like the one that I teach on at Falmouth um, just to skill up and be able to actually do that. Um, but once you've got over that, um, that skill barrier, you can create brand new game content and you can invent new game mechanics. You can make any type of game that you can imagine within the limitations of the technology. Um, so there are some tools out there that have tried to remove this barrier of needing programming skills and needing to kind of highly specialise in a technical domain. So things like click and play and gamematic. Um, so they remove that need for programming skills and still allow you to create quite a wide variety of things. But you still can't do that just with the device you have in your pocket, just using your thumb. Um, you still need to have a, a desktop PC or a laptop to kind of anchor you down while you're creating. Of course, you can then deploy the game to a mobile device, but that's not quite the same thing. So in terms of what you can actually do on your mobile phone, um, there are some um, systems like Scratch Junior and Hopscotch, which do allow you to create entirely on the phone, but they require some kind of programming skills. So things like Scratch and Hopscotch, it, you may not be typing C++ code into a, an IDE, but you know, you're dragging if blocks and for blocks and things like that. You're essentially still programming. And in fact, these tools are usually marketed as kind of tools to teach children the principles of programming rather than, per se, tools for teaching game design or for just casual game design. Um, there are also tools like uh, Coder Game and Player. Um, I'm not giving references for any of these, but they are in the paper, and if you just search the App Store, then you'll find them. Um, so these allow you to create on the mobile device, and they don't require programming skills, but they're really just reskinning. So you're taking a, an existing template, like a Space Invaders game or a Flappy Bird game, and you, know, you can put your friends' faces in there, you can replace the music, but you don't really have any control over the mechanics of the game or over really anything that affects how the game is played. Um, we also have things like Createria and Sketch Nation, and I'm including Minecraft in this category as well. Um, so if you haven't seen these, essentially Createria is, I think they are heavily inspired by things like Little Big Planet and Super Mario Maker on the consoles, but on mobile devices. Um, so they're essentially level design tools. So you can design new content that affects the gameplay, but only within the template of a Mario-style platform game, for example. Um, and Minecraft, you know, you can build structures and you can do quite sophisticated things, but it's still within the framework of a Minecraft map 
It's not, you can't decide that you're going to make Magic the Gathering in Minecraft or something, although someone probably has tried. Um, so this is where our app comes in, Gamica. And the hope is that when this is finally finished, it will tick all four of these boxes. You will be able to create entirely new game content and entirely new game mechanics entirely on your mobile phone without having to learn any kind of programming um, skills or techniques. Um, so I'm going to show you now for the next couple of minutes what the app can do and uh, what the current state of it is. Uh, okay. So I'm just projecting my phone screen here and hoping I don't get any embarrassing text while I do this. Um, so this is what you get um, when you first start the app. Um, so this is what we call the base camp. This is a selection of games that we've designed um, with the app. Eventually it will include the games that you've designed and saved. Um, but you can already do that. Uh, so we've got a few things you might spot. So we've got an Asteroids clone in there. We've got a Frogger clone somewhere else. And then we've got a few more um, that are a bit more novel that use... Um, kind of new game mechanics that we've invented. Um, so this one's called Rebel Forces. Um, Simon designed this one in the week that uh, Star Wars Episode Seven came out. Um, so you can put in a bit of kind of flavor text and help text to try and get a bit of story into the game. Because in terms of gameplay, a lot of these games are very abstract. Um, but you can try and kind of project a bit of narrative onto them as the designer. Um, so you're part of the rebel force fighting against the Imperial Guard, blah, blah, blah. Please don't sue us, George Lucas. Uh, but basically, I control this, this kind of flask-shaped thing in the middle. And what I want to do, it's very hard to do it while looking at the big screen, I want to let the white balls in, because they're the, uh, the good guys. I, yes, and I don't want to... I don't, oh, I don't want to let the blues in, because the, the blues, basically, when a blue collides with a white, it kills it. So, for example, if, if one of the... Ah, and, yeah, now, now a blue's gone in, so any whites that go in there are just going to instantly die. Um, I am really horrible at this game. Um, uh, so we've got a few others. So, for example, Asteroids. This is a, a kind of reinterpretation of Asteroids. So there's my spaceship in the middle. Uh, and I can kind of tap around and destroy the things. So they're all based on this idea of kind of having objects on screen and things happening when they collide and there are conditions that determine whether you win or lose the game, um, and that kind of thing. But what I can do now, once I've got one of these games, if I want to change it, I can swipe along. Um, so first of all, we've got um, an image generation system, um, which... Mike and other people probably recognize as uh, something that Simon was working on quite a long time ago. Um, so this, I can choose a different image. Um, no, I can't because it doesn't work in this version of the app, but in theory I can. <laughs> um, yes, the perils of live demos. Um, we can also draw images by hand, which um, I'll show you a little bit more later on. Um, but the bulk of the um, setup of the game is using these uh, numerical sliders. So, for example, I can change the cosmetics of the game, so I can change the backing image to something like that, and that already changes the aesthetics of the game quite a lot. Um, but I can also change the, um, so I can change the color of the bullets as well. And I can change things that have a bit more impact on gameplay. So the friend size here is the size of the bullets in this particular game. So if I crank that right up, then you can see I'm now shooting these huge bullets. Um, so that changes the game quite a bit. I can change, for example, what happens when... Um, so a friend and foe collision. So that's what happens when a bullet collides with an asteroid. Um, so currently it destroys both of those objects, but I can set it, for example, so that they stick together instead. And let's see how that changes the game. So you can see it kind of makes the game completely unplayable now, but uh, you can imagine if I also change what the, the win conditions are for the game, then you can imagine kind of creating some kind of game around these mechanics. Um, so the idea is you can start with one of these base camp games, like you can start with Asteroids, and within half an hour of 
tweaking around and changing things like changing how the, con how the game's controlled, what, what the end condition is, how it's scored, how you win or lose. You can end up with something completely different. And indeed, any of these games can, in theory, be arrived at from any of the others by tweaking the right parameters. Um, so that's where we're um, aiming for with this. OK, so what makes a game in Gamica? Um, so there are, at present, 284 parameters in those screens. And um, every time we have a crazy idea for a parameter, and by we, I mean Simon, um, that number grows. So it was originally, um, we literally originally started with zero parameters, I think. Um, this, this was one game called Friends and Foes, um, where balls came in and you had to kind of swipe the thing to bat them away. And then we thought, well, what if we allow the users to change the size of the balls? And then what if we allow them to change the color? And then what if we allow them to change the size of the thing in the middle? And then what if we make them stick instead of bouncing away? And that kind of spirals on and on and on. And you eventually reach this 284 dimensional vector that includes quite a wide um, space of games. Um, so these are some of the categories of uh, parameters that we have. So we have the kind of aesthetic parameters and then things that affect the dynamics of the games and how they're scored and how the user controls them. Um, there's also an optional vector graphic, which um, I'll go back to the app in a minute and show you. And you have this um, flavor text that can either give the, user, the player some hint about what they're actually trying to achieve, or it can give them a bit of story, or both. Um, and one of the significant um, things we've gone for in the design of this is an, this idea of emergence, which Simon's going to be talking about in a few minutes. Um, so if you think about things like uh, VGDL and puzzle script and that kind of environment, it's very kind of prescriptive. You're saying this, this is your player character. When you press the left arrow key, it moves 16 pixels to the left. When it collides with this type of thing, it both of them are destroyed and this happens. Um, so it's, it's quite sort of linear and um, prescriptive. Whereas we're much more interested in emergence and particularly the emergence that you get from having a, a physics engine in there. So instead of saying when you press the left arrow key, the character moves to the left, we say when you tap on the screen here, a force is applied to this body. And there's complexity in that, that if the body's already moving in a different direction, then that's going to cause it to kind of curve around. And things are bouncing off each other, so it's not a case of when these two come together, one of them shoots upwards. They bounce off each other as if they were billiard balls, and that can create kind of very complex um, interactions that, as the designer, you might not be able to predict, OK, if I move this slider here, this is exactly the game that I'm going to get. But as we'll see in the next talk, sometimes that can give you things that you hadn't thought of that you think, well, actually, that's quite a cool idea and I'm going to run with it rather than trying to kind of arrive at exactly the thing that I had in my mind if I had a specific idea in my mind at all. OK, so as a case study, um, we'll look at a game that, as I say, Simon designed called uh, Let It Snow. So this is a, a simple kind of color matching puzzle game, um, but with the twist that it has the physics engine. Um, so you can see the blue and white balls are raining down from the screen. Um, you can see happening in places when four balls of the same color meet, they explode. Um, for every blue ball that explodes, I lose a point. For every white ball that explodes, I gain a point. The only thing I can do as the player is I can tap on blue balls and I can make them explode. But obviously that loses me a point, so I don't want to do it too much. So what I want to try and do, and it's really dangerous trying to actually play this game and be good at it in front of an audience, but I want to get into the situation where I've got all of the blues in kind of groups of two and three so that they're not um, creating fours, and I want the whites to be snowing down and creating groups and racking up the score. 
Now you can see it's stopped now because the number of balls on screen of each colour is limited. If I tap a blue ball now, then you'll see another blue ball gets to spawn and some stuff exploded, so the whites start spawning. Um, but you, you kind of get the idea of that. I'm not going to embarrass myself by playing it anymore. Yes, yes you can. So you can, uh, I'll just show you that quickly. So you can, if things get stuck, you can kind of jiggle things around. That's really just a, a way of breaking a stalemate. You don't get much control over the game by doing that. Um, okay, so yeah, just briefly, blue and white balls are falling from the top of the screen. The number of each on screen is limited. Match four. Whites are good, blues are bad, and you can explode blues by tapping. So it's a fairly simple um, game of the type of casual game that you might see on mobile, but with that little twist of being physics-based rather than something like Bejeweled, where it's all very much grid-based and uh, very predictable. Um, so I keep saying that I'm going to show you the, the drawing interface and then forgetting to. I am going to show it to you now. Um, so... We want to um, release Let It Snow as a kind of standalone game, but we want to have a little bonus in there of a little bit of creation that the players can do. So our idea for that is you can draw new levels. Um, so the, the default level has these vertical lines, so you get these columns that the balls fall into. Um, but you can get rid of those, and you can draw something else. So for example, I could draw some circles, and I can make those into actual circles. Um, then I can copy them around, and I can get a kind of maybe an Olympic ring type configuration. Um, and then straight away I can play the game, and I can see how that affects the gameplay. So obviously now that I don't have these columns that the, the balls can fall into, that's going to change the, the tactics that I have to use to win the game maybe. Um, so I can experiment with drawing different things, like maybe I could draw some diagonal lines, or maybe I could draw some squiggly lines, and I could see what, um, what effect that has on the gameplay. <clears throat> now, of course, when I do that, um, I might get something that's far too easy or far too difficult. So the parameters in, in the original level... Um, meaning how fast the balls spawn, how many per second, how fast they fall down the screen, the size of the balls, whether they're large or small. Um, they were all tweaked to um, give a, a reasonable level of difficulty for the vertical lines. As soon as you change the layout of the level, that could completely change um, that difficulty scaling. So... The shape that we draw has a big impact on the playability, and we need to tweak those parameters in relation. Um, so the parameters that we chose out of those 284 to tweak, because um, obviously if you tweak all 284 of them, then you could, in theory, end up tweaking too far and end up with asteroids or something. So we wanted to limit it so that you're still, you know, however you tweak those parameters, you're still ending up with something that's recognizably let it snow. Um, so we chose to tweak the spawn rate, um, the maximum number on screen, uh, the size of the balls, and the speed with which they fall, whether they fall quickly or slowly, um, whether they kind of drift down from the top or really plummet down. Um, so that's four parameters, and they, we can tweak them independently for the two colors of balls, so we have eight parameters to tweak. So that 284 um, dimensional space, we're kind of taking an eight dimensional subspace of that, that we are fairly arbitrarily saying is the space of Levitt Snow Levels. Um, of course, we could have chosen differently, but this is what we decided to go with. Um, so if we want to tweak these parameters and assess how playable the level is, um, one way to do that is to have some sort of automated play tester, some sort of AI that can play the levels. Of course, we could try to do it statically and say, if the balls are smaller, then the level's probably harder. Although we've actually seen some evidence that you can't really draw that kind of conclusion in a way that generalizes across all levels. Um, and there's a bit more detail on that in the paper. Um, so what we went with is a playtester, an AI bot that can play these levels. 
And this uses four pretty simple um, strategies. So it tries to stop the blue clusters from forming by saying, okay, if we've got three blues and another one's incoming, then we tap the, either the one that's incoming or one of the three. Um, if we've got kind of a cluster of whites that wants to form but is blocked by one blue ball, so you can see if we popped this one, then these two would meet these two and we'd get a white cluster. Then we pop the blue. And a couple of others that unstick from stalemates. So if the, the game has reached one of these stages where nothing's happening, um, then we tap a blue at random. And it's actually not completely at random. We have some rules that say, I think it's tap a blue that isn't in a large cluster and that's touching the most whites possible or something like that. Um, and if you get really stuck, so no whites have been able to spawn for ages, you haven't been able to get a single white cluster for the past 10 seconds or something, then you do that little shaking manoeuvre um, to try and unstick things, because you've clearly got into quite a, a bad stalemate in that position. Um, so I can quickly show you this playtester doing a better job of playing the game than I did, uh, although that's not difficult. So if, uh, And this is all parameterizable as well, by the way, so you can change the, the tactics that are used and some of the parameters that go into them. Um, let's do it on the original level as well, because that level is probably not playable. And this is a feature that we want to have in the app itself. Um, so you'll see when the need arises, which it will fairly soon, there we go. That is actually my hand. Um, in case you're wondering, that it appears on screen and the, the green text that you probably can't see very well is telling you which of those tactics the player's using. Um, so you can actually, this is strangely hypnotic and uh, one of the cool things I find about game AI is sometimes I'll make something that I just sit and stare at for hours because it's kind of interesting to watch and, uh, ooh, did you see that then? Pop, 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 that was amazing. This is like, yeah, this is an eSport waiting to happen. It really is. Um, yeah, let's not watch that the much longer. The second time I, I ran it, it hit my eyes strong. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I, I felt the was in there. I don't know <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so anyway, this, um, yeah, this originally we put in as just the mechanism for playtesting these games, but it turns out it is actually an entertainment as well and you know to have a successful mobile app you you need to be entertaining you need to give something um to, to people that they want to use when they're on the bus or whatever um however you may be asking i'm preempting this as a question because i can i can tell probably at least a third of the room is itching to ask it at the end why not a general play tester you know why not mcts or um deep learning or whatever the, the flavor of the month is. Um, of course, I, I was previously in the field of MCTS, so I know better than many people that uh, MCTS is wonderful, and uh, I'm only now being indoctrinated into computational creativity. Um, but there are a few issues with using a general playtester for this specific uh, project. So we really want to optimize the levels with respect to the kind of let it snow strategy. Um, we don't want to have a general playtester in there that can adapt too much to weird levels because then we'd get weird levels generated. Um, and I think for a lot of these kind of casual games, people like to play them and sort of zone out a little bit. So if you give them something that's too weird that makes them rethink their strategy too much, then it's gonna be a bit too jarring for them and maybe it's not going to be quite as successful as a casual game. Um, also, we don't want to just have a black box in there. We don't want to tell people, yeah, this is just using MCTS, it does 10,000 rollouts and then chooses the best move on average. because that's not really satisfying. We want to give people something that we can explain and say, yeah, if there's, if there's three blues and another one's coming in, then it taps one of those blues. You know, that's something that everyone can understand. Um, so yeah, MCTS isn't ideal for that and um, deep learning is even worse, of course, because probably even the people who are working on deep learning don't quite understand how that's playing. Um, and also, we, we really want to stick with this idea of having everything run on the user's device. 
I mean, it would be the easiest thing in the world to ship this out to a powerful server somewhere and then, you know, have it churn away for 10 minutes and ping back and say, there we go, there's your level. But there is something nice about being able to watch this actually happening in real time and knowing that everything is happening on this device. You know, you can disconnect the Wi-Fi, you can disconnect the mobile network, and it's still all happening there. There's something quite uh, satisfying about that, I think. And um, I was going to have a, a rant about um, SpriteKit, which is Apple's um, game development framework. Um, all I will say is, if you are creating a test bed for AI, do not use the, the physics engine in SpriteKit. And if you want to know more about that, then um, come and see me over lunch and I will rant happily about it. But there are a few design decisions in there that make sense for game development, but do not make sense for AI development. Um, so we have our play tester for Let It Snow. Um, how do we actually use that to tweak the levels? Um, so this is very much a, a kind of baseline piece of work that we're presenting today. This is the simplest possible thing that we could think of that actually worked. Um, and we're calling it fail fast random search. So this is, the fail fast part is inspired by how human game designers tend to work, which is they'll tweak something, they'll quickly play test it, and usually within like five seconds you can tell, yeah, this is no good, I'm gonna have to change something else, or yeah, this has promise, I'm gonna stick with it. So you, you wouldn't usually, as a human, think, okay, I need to play test this 50 times and then take the average. You'd know within a couple of seconds whether it's good or not. Um, so we're trying to kind of capture that here. Um, so the basic method is, um, we repeat this. So we just randomize the values of those eight parameters and we randomize them within plus or minus 30% of their original values. Um, there's, nothing more, there's nothing cleverer than that going on in this version literally just random sampling uniformly within plus or minus 30%. Um, and then we do at most three playtests with the automated playtester. We play the game with that playtester. And on the next slide, I'm going to have some criteria that we have for that playtest. If any one of those fails, we throw that random variation away. We go back here and choose another random variation. So we're failing fast. If we get one failure, throw it away, start again. If we make it through three playtests and none of those conditions fails, then we assume right now that that's a decent game. It may not be perfect, but we present it to the user and say, okay, this is the tweaked game that I found. I think it's pretty good. And then it's the user's call whether they want to keep that or whether they want to press the button again to, to do the tweak again. Uh, so the criteria we look at um, just briefly, if the score reaches minus 30, then the game's too hard. Like if you have a very rapid spawning of blues, so they just rain down from the top and all pop instantly, that's too hard, throw it away. If you can win the level within 20 seconds, that's too easy. Um, I should have said, by the way, the win condition for this game is reaching a score of, well, depending on the level, either 50 or 100 points, um, which you can... Well, an expert player like Simon can usually do in less than a minute. So that's our kind of benchmark that we're looking at. So if you get it within 20 seconds, then that's probably too easy. And likewise, if you've got to 80 seconds and you haven't achieved it, then it's probably too hard. Um, we also want these moments where everything stops because they're quite um, satisfying as a human player because they give you a little bit of time to think and ponder your next move. If they never happen then it's a little bit too frantic and you're just basically spending all of your time firefighting and trying to stop blues from forming clusters, so which, you know, is playable in a sense, but it's not the type of level that we're looking for. We're looking for a bit more thoughtful um, gameplay. Um, or we have a couple of conditions that actually, it turns out, weren't used all that much um, in the searches that we ran, um, of the average tap rate being too fast, so if you have to really tap frantically, or if the average distance between taps is too large, so you're having to kind of go up and down the screen quite a lot. Um, but yeah, they, they may be more useful if, um, if these criteria are different, but we found that they weren't really distinguishing um, in our experiments. Um, and it's important to note that everything that I've just described is customizable by the user in the app. So those failure conditions, the parameters of the search, 
Um, it's the user's call as designer whether they want to, to change those or not. Um, so the, the playtester tactics as well. Um, so the idea is this is kind of going some way towards the mixed initiative thing from earlier, I think, which um, the user still has some control over the design process, but they're a little bit more hands-off, that they're more setting parameters for the search rather than manually tweaking everything by hand. Um, but they're not giving up all of their control and just saying, okay, I'm going to press a button and you do wonderful things for me. Um, okay, so here's a few results. Um, so this, this table, um, we ran this for 18 instances because that's how many CPU cores we had spare. Um, I should say we ran this on uh, desktop max, but um, we set up the conditions so that it's, it's reasonable to, um, to carry them across to mobile devices. We just didn't want to burn out all of our phones by running all of this stuff. Um, so the fastest instances within like half an hour managed to find a reasonable game. Um, then we had some that took 20 hours and the last two didn't finish within 24 hours, so we killed them. Um, and you can see here that, um, so this is the number of the trials that failed after one, two or three play tests. And we ended up with 16 successes, which are these 16. But you can see that 99.2% of the random variations were just discarded very quickly after one playtest, which you might expect because random isn't going to give you anything particularly useful. Um, so yeah, as I said, this is purely a baseline. Surprise, surprise, it's not um, a world-beating technique. Um, so what we tried to do next is try and cut down some of those games that are going, just going to fail the first playtest. Because even though that's failing fast, it would be better if we could avoid failing at all. Um, yep, so more than 95%. So again, the simplest thing that we tried that seemed to work was training some decision trees um, using Weaker to try and predict which levels will fail the first test. So we just had as our training set all of the data from that experiment and two classes, those that failed the first test and those that succeeded the first test. Regardless of whether they then failed the second or third test or succeeded, we were just looking at that first play test. And we trained two classifiers, one on the level that we were actually tweaking and one that was trained on a set of other levels, um, just to check that we weren't kind of overfitting our decision trees to the specific level um, that we trained. But it actually turned out the, the decision, decision trees were fairly similar for both of those, so it didn't make too much difference. And the tenfold cross-validation accuracy is around 83%, so these classifiers aren't perfect, but they're, they're okay. Um, and um, yeah, I really just put this slide in because this is something that um, to me seems like a really simple idea and I'm not sure if people are already doing it. So I'm hoping that if this is a standard technique that people do, then someone can wave at me and tell me and then I can cite them. Um, but the usual way I think that you'd use a decision tree is you'd use it as basically a binary classifier and you'd do um, rejection sampling. So you sample your random instances as usual, but then you feed them into the decision tree. And if they fail, then you throw them away. If they succeed, then you take them through to the more in-depth testing. Um, but what we do instead is we kind of run the decision tree in reverse. So we start by choosing a success node in the decision tree, uh, this one for example. And then we traverse back to the root. So each of the um, edges in the decision tree gives us a constraint on the parameters that we're randomizing. So this one, for example, says that the max whites parameter needs to be less or equal to 15 to go down this branch. Um, if we read all of those off on a path that goes from the root to a success node, then that gives us a narrowed um, interval for sampling. So for this root node, for instance, um, so we can read off that the max whites needs to be less or equal to 15. From the next one, the max whites needs to be greater than 9. Um, the next one tells us max whites less or equal to 20, but we've already got 15 here, so that's not any new information. And then the next one tells us the max blues is less than or equal to 16. Um, so that now, if as long as we sample from our parameters within these ranges, we can guarantee that if we fed that instance into the decision tree, 
then it would reach a success node. I don't know, is, is, are we reinventing the wheel here or is this a thing that people do or do not do? Hmm. Yeah, I think it's a little bit similar to that, maybe. But yeah, if, if someone can tell me, yeah, this is, this is Smith's what technique. Is, in training industry, how many games are you running for um, I can't remember off the top of my head. This is in the paper. I think we had something like 250 um, instances in each class. So we had about 500 instances to train this tree. Um, Um, so we had um, 250, an equal number in each class. So half of them were. 249. That was just in, in the run of the experiments, that was the number of successes that we had. And then we sampled the same number of failures. And sadly, it was 249, not 250. I was tempted to run an extra few just to, to bump it up by one. But, yeah. um, OK, so, so yeah, we're using this decision tree to sample um, instances that hopefully will not fail that first test. Um, and the results we get, um, well, it's a little bit better. So now only about 95% um, fail the first test, not 99%. So, you know, we haven't quite achieved the goal of getting this down to zero, but, you know, we're, we're getting there. Um, <clears throat> and um, the important thing you can see is these, the search using the decision tree actually does find playable games faster. Um, so all of them finished within the 24 hours, and the fastest ones were giving um, answers in minutes. If you look around the median level, the completely uninformed random search was taking like 10 hours in the median, um, and the decision tree searches were taking sort of two hours, three and a half hours, that kind of region. Um, which is still probably a little bit longer than you're going to want to wait on your mobile device, but it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's progress. Sorry? Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, nearly getting there now. Um, yeah, and you can look at this in paper in more detail, but the, the reasons why the, um, why the instances failed, they are different from the... Uh, from the two searches. So the, in particular, the, the score less than minus 30 criterion, that seems to be what's really getting reduced by the uh, decision trees. That seems to be what it's, it's finding. Um, so the, the new search is still bad, but it's an improvement. Um, so this is still too slow for, you know, if you press a button while you're on the train and you have to wait three and a half hours, then, well, if you're getting the train in Cornwall, that's fine, because everywhere takes ages there, but anywhere else, no, but um, you could, for example, uh, plug in your phone overnight, leave it on the bedside table, and then in the morning it's come back with something. Or, of course, we could just run this on, on cloud servers and have it come back in 10 minutes or something. Um, we did a bit of a curation analysis on this, so we looked at the first five games that came out of each search and said, OK, if, if we were the designer, how many of those would we say, yeah, that's a pretty good game, I'm going to keep that? And it was around about um, three in five. Um, obviously, that's not a huge sample size, but it, it kind of demonstrates that this is finding reasonable games, and you could expect within two or three clicks of the button, you're going to find something reasonable. So if it's taking three hours, for example, then overnight it could give you three alternatives, and hopefully one of those would be decent. Um, so just quickly, future work for this project. Um, we're going to look at better search methods, so hill climbing and evolutionary methods and that kind of stuff. Um, more options for the user to change how the search is working and how the playtest is working. Um, and again, this is studied a bit in the paper, um, plotting graphs and things of how the difficulty varies with the parameter um, variations. So saying, you know, if you tweak this parameter up, then that will make the game harder. But if you tweak, tweak it too much, then there's a kind of bell curve and it makes it easier again. Um, so that providing that kind of information to the user is something that we can do quite easily with uh, automated playtesting. And in terms of the app itself, I think Simon's going to um, say more about this. Um, but 
sadly, none of us in the Metamakers Institute are experts on HCI, um, which I think shows in the current version of the app. Um, so we really want to um, think about what we can do to achieve this goal of letting novices design games with this, and particularly emphasizing the drawing aspects, because that's quite tactile and quite understandable. Um, and looking at getting more kind of search and AI technologies in there to try and co-create with the, the user and help them achieve what they want to achieve or possibly um, challenge what they want to achieve and make them want to achieve different things. Um, and this isn't just ivory tower research, um, not that I'm saying that anyone else's research is, um, but we really do want to get this out there to the general public and we're hoping to get something out there very soon, although we've been saying that for the past nine months, um, and get it out there into the hands of, of the public and see how they respond to it and what feedback we get from them and uh, whether we are achieving our goals and what we can do to achieve those goals. And then something else, and it's going to make us all rich. Um, so to conclude, um, we've got this app, Gamica, which allows users to invent entirely new game mechanics without programming directly on their mobile phone. Um, we're trying to democratize game design, make it so that it's not just the people who have formal training in computing or in game design who can design games, everyone can. And the stuff that I've described today, we realize this is proof of concept, this is really basic stuff, it really doesn't work all that well yet. But we're making steps in the right direction, we hope, and uh, we're showing that there is scope for using these automated tools to take some of the tedium out of having to continually tweak things and try things out and uh, kind of probe around in the dark, we can give users a little bit more guidance in that respect. Um, and that's it, so thank you. Um, so in our curation analysis, we did see that there was a reasonable variety. So within those five that we looked at um, for each level and for each search method, it wasn't just a case of it's found the same solution five times. We did get at least two or three different things in there that were quite, you know, quite recognizably different um, variants there. And what you see in the decision trees is there are kind of several success nodes in there. So there are several different ways that you can restrict that parameter space and still get a playable game. So it's not like it's just one main path that it's going down. Um, so yeah, I think there's a reasonable variety in there. Okay, uh, yeah? So I've published a couple papers on this pretty much, mm -hmm. I think. So it's very interesting how you use the tree to, to prove the fit, so I didn't know how to do that. Okay. Uh, uh, but should you, well, I found that differential evolution was very good for searching the space. Like okay. Within 250 ish, we were able to zero in on the right game. Okay, so that's good. Make some math improvements there. Uh, the other thing is that we found that a player model was really important. Mm -hmm. Like, you can't assume that all players have the same skill. Okay. So instead of throwing out the games if the players can do too much, hmm. make that a parameter for the AI. Okay. Because novices and experts don't. Hmm. Yeah, so that's, that's, yeah, absolutely. So that we were trying to kind of capture that in the uh, design of the uh, tactics for the automated play tester. So our, our idea was that the player could kind of try to model their, the way that they play themselves, because that's kind of what we did with this play tester and possibly try to capture it there. But I think, yeah, using some kind of player modeling to, to try and automate that would definitely be a good idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But when you make the demonstration, you add already uh, a set of uh, mechanics for uh, collisions, mm -hmm. and you define new, uh, I don't know, new, new thing for the collisions uh, without, uh, without coding, without programming? Um, at present, no, you have those preset things, but the, 
the idea is more that from those presets, uh, game mechanics can emerge. So if you have balls of the same color stick together, let's say, say white balls stick together, blue balls, when they collide, one of them gets destroyed. When a white and a blue collide, they just pass through each other. If, like, it's not so much that each of those is a mechanic in itself, but the combination of those can kind of give things emerging that you haven't, uh, you know, that are more than the sum of their parts. No, we're, we're trying to use the, the combinatorics of, you know, you have a 284 dimensional space, so there's a lot of room in there for, for new things, we hope.